Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Color Authority. It's a beautiful day here in Milan in Italy. I'm super excited today for my talk with Alicia Kashishan, currently residing in Northern California. Alicia is an award-winning designer with more than 40 years of professional experience as an art director, graphic designer, service designer, illustrator, and color consultant. She holds a BFA in design illustration from the CCAC and was an artist in resident at the Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina. She currently produces a line of custom handmade-to-order carpets and is a popular speaker, presenter, and teacher on design and color. Alicia has owned and operated her own textile business as well as design for various industries and corporations such as Papyrus, Bloomingdale's, CBS Publications, New York Magazine, and many more. Her true love has always been color and texture. Alicia comes from a long line of accomplished artists, and her emergence as a rug maker is thanks to her family. Her Armenian-born grandfather, uncles, and cousins are renowned Oriental rug authorities and collectors. And that is why carpets and color have been part of Alicia's life as long as she can remember. The smell of the wool, the touch of the fibers, the variety of the patterns are all in her DNA. Alicia, how are you today? And welcome to my podcast. Hello, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really excited by what you're doing. And it's a beautiful day here, so I feel pretty good. So where are you uh, just now? You're at home? I'm at, I have a studio at my home, and it's in uh, Northern California, just north of San Francisco. And so winter here, I've got a sunny day, and the grass is green. And the oranges are on the trees. It's lovely. I'm so jealous. Here um, in Italy, Milan, it's, it's getting cold. We get the Siberian uh, wind right now. Uh, so I, I'd love to be in California right now. Tell the audience a little bit about what your daily what life was like when you were growing up in, in such an artistic family. Can you bring us a little bit into that world of the smells of, of wool? <laughs> sure. Well, there's sort of two tracks going on, which is that my family, there was a creative spirit in our house at all times. And there was sort of an unspoken aesthetic. And my, my family, they were big adventurers and travelers. And, uh, you know, so my my grandparents' house and our house, we were full of all these little treasures and art things. And so then on one side of the family, my uh, father's side of the family, were in the rug business for, for a very long time. My grandfather was born overseas. I mean, he was born in Armenia and a long story, how he made his way here. Um, and we'd go into their house. And so there were rugs, an awareness of rugs everywhere. Uh, there were layers and layers of rugs. If we went to the, at their home, their home was a sort of a dark, imposing house. And it was very physical to go there. But I mean, literally there were rugs draped over all the furniture. The couches had rugs on them. The floors were, you know, three and four layers deep of rugs. And so there was a very strong smell, uh, if people are aware of that with rugs. And so you could walk into the space. And to me, it was, it sort of embraced me and it would sort of flood all over me. And if I'd go to their shop, there's a very distinct smell of, you know, sort of the animals, clean animal wool which to me is very heartwarming. I love it. And so, uh, you know, that's the one side. So there's the artistic side, lots of artists in my family. They're the collectors. Both of my, uh, my grandparents were collectors. My uncles were collectors of rugs. And so I was sort of surrounded by it. I feel very lucky because so many people I know growing up didn't have any support in the arts and they were sort of told it wasn't a good option, but I was surrounded by it and it was honored. So I, I, again, I feel lucky about that. So your family from the moment you wanted to be, you know, an artist, a designer and work in, in this world, you got the full support because it is going through your veins. It's in your blood. Absolutely. I mean, I started studying art from a very young child. And as I said, there were so many artists around us and my mother was a painter. And, uh, you know, I, I remember very fondly, my mother would say, let's just go for a drive so that we could go look at the colors in the sky. And so she sort of introduced me to color. And I've had this, you know, deep desire and love of color from an early age without even knowing it and just having that exposure. So from a very young age, I was told that being an artist was a good thing. It was honored. It was a viable career choice. So I was always supported in studying art. I went to a high school, actually, that was uh, geared specifically towards the arts. Uh, my mother was such an adventurer. And at one point she said, wouldn't you like to go study art in Greece? 
Uh, yeah. And I basically think she would have liked to go to study art in Greece and um, it wasn't available to her at that time. So, you know, those are the sorts of things that not many people had an opportunity. So I was quite young. I was 17 and I went to Greece by myself to study art. And, you know, and also all my schooling was geared towards art with it, with the thought that that's my career path. There was, um, you know, a little side story is that all my siblings were, they did um, human engineering testing. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Well, they study aptitudes. It's a like two or three day testing process. It's pretty intense. And at the end of that time, they say, you know, oh, you'd be a good lawyer or you'd be a good doctor or whatever. And so my siblings all took those tests. And as an adult, when I was ready for a career change, I said, you know, mom, why didn't I ever take that test? And she just laughed and she said, oh, honey, it was always clear what you were going to do. There were no questions. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay. But I did take the tests on my own and they told me I would be a good two dimensional designer, which is like, oh, I was, you know, that's great. That's what I was doing, but I was ready for a change though. But that's a confirmation, right? It sounds, I'm just now, because we are, you and I, we're both visual persons, obviously, because we work in in color. I'm now envisioning you in that car with your mom, looking at (laughs) at the clouds and the sky and all the colors that you were surrounded by. I think that is uh, a beautiful, beautiful youth. It sounds very romantic as well. Did you, in the end, go to Greece? Yes, I did. Oh, it was just pure magic. So again, think of a 17-year-old. And you know, I'll back up a little bit too. I did not really um, jive with most of my peers most of my life because I've sort of been an introvert and I've been more of an artist. And so I just wasn't into, you know, boys and posters of music, you know, in my uh, locker where people had posters of boys. I had posters of uh, wild animals from Africa, for example. So I, I just had a different, my just, I was on a different track my whole life. So at 17 to go by myself to study art in Greece on a Greek island in the Aegean, actually, you know, what could be better? I was just, I was in a trance for a few months. I mean, it was, I think I went for three or four months, but I was in a trance and all I would do all day is go draw and, uh, it's sort of a longer story. There's a lot about that, but I was with mostly um, college and postgraduate people. So they're much older than me, but all I do is draw all day long and, and you know, look at the Aegean Sea. So painting and drawing are one of those first skills that, that one learns when an artist, when a designer, of course, and then obviously you immediately come into contact with, with color. Yes. So color is yeah. indeed one of the first informations that arrives to our human brain. So how do you work with color in a world where also color is cited by then textures and patterns, um, you know, being a rock designer? Uh, you know, there's, I think there's a few parts to that. And I think it can sort of be um, broken down because to me, it's also intertwined and woven, but, you know, understandably it's not. So I think that there's ways to look at it sort of as a fine artist or as a designer. I think each, depending on how you approach it, it's going to be slightly different. So as a rug designer, I've, I've learned to separate them. And I've got so many thoughts going here. My mind's going in a thousand directions here. So if we're speaking specifically about the rugs, um, what I've discovered is that, as you and I both know, color is very personal. And people have a very visceral reaction, a very physical and emotional reaction to color. So while uh, I may be more more advanced in thinking about pattern and so forth, so I think about what a pattern might be appropriate, I have to nail down the color first because most people aren't able to see around it. They think I want a rug, but they don't know what that means. So I have to go through the process and usually they're not aware of this, but I just look at what their taste is and what, what they surround themselves with. And before anything else, I have to find what their color is. And frequently they don't know what it is. But as you and I know, we all have a color that's sort of deeply embedded in ourselves that we relate to that that works for us. So I need to find what their color is. And then I can start to bring in the concept of, of pattern design before I even get to texture. So I sort of have to go in a progression of information. And again, color is the first one. Then I go into pattern and then I can start talking about the details of maybe what the textures and the structural aspects might be. So let's say I'm, I'm one of your new customers and I want um, you (laughs) to um, design a rug. How would that process come about? Because how do you find out what that color is that I apparently, you know, bring along with me? Yeah. Uh, You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a process and it depends frequently. um, 
if I've got a local client, I go to their home and I'm just a quiet observer. I go in and I look around. And then frequently it's, a, it's as simple as I've got a very deep library of my own design. So I bring that with me in a, you know, in a binder and we flip through it. And what I'll notice is that they'll always pick a red rug. They're not looking at design. They're not looking whether it's a traditional or transitional or contemporary design. They're just picking a color and they don't know that, but it's really obvious to me. So that a lot of times what I'll have to do is start to navigate it and I'll know which designs might be appropriate for them. I can sense that pretty easily by seeing what they're selecting from the, from my binder or what they are looking at uh, in their, what their homes look like. So once we start to get to that point, I'll say, oh, I see that, you know, you may want a red rug here. You'll see this design in my binder might be printed in blue but I can adapt that. So it's a bit of a process and a little bit of massaging them here and there to get them on track. And as I've said, usually it's, they're unaware of it and it's a bit of a revelation and you could see the little sparkle in their eye or the little delight that happens when we, we land on these pieces of information that ring true for them. So and, observation uh, is one of the most important key words at this point, I guess, when you uh, go into this process, you observe yes. your customer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's actually, to my surprise, it was something that um, I hadn't really expected. And I was surprised to to find that I was pretty good at that, which, uh, again, I had not expected. But those observational skills, I guess, have been honed after years and years. And, you know, I didn't start in rugs or textiles. I started in graphics and magazines and so forth. So, you know, each industry has its different calls and different needs and how you apply it. But I think I'd been doing it long enough. I was able to start reading the clients. You know, I I worked for uh, a friend of mine recommended a client. And afterwards, apparently the client said to my friend, did you tell her what I wanted? Uh And did you tell her what I was looking for? Did you tell her what I'm, you know, and my friend said, no, I didn't tell her anything. She goes, wow, I assumed you did because she just nailed it. So it's something I've really enjoyed. And it's, it's, that's part of the magic for me is finding that little treasure and, and being able to let it blossom. I think that is a great wisdom that you have is that indeed by observing and, and just um, trusting your own feelings by um, observing that person, that customer and translating that. Um, because as you say, color is highly personal. And um, in you, I know your opinion transcends color trends, which is quite different from how most of us yeah. uh, work in the industry. Can you yeah. elaborate a little bit on that, how you see that? Yes. Well, I think, again, what we are talking about, too, is the personal avenue of color. And then there's industry. And so what's happened is I've worked, I've worked in industry for many, many years in different, different uh, career paths. And so with that, you know, as we all know that people that work in color, we don't necessarily have a favorite color. What we understand is how colors are relation, based on relationships with other colors. Uh, if we're working in industry and you're doing manufacturing or whatever, then you realize that your color palette is not based on a personal choice. It's based on all the information that, for example, what you do is what is the story, what's happening in society, what's happening culturally, internationally, politically, economically. So those all influence how we see color and they they inform color trends moving forward. So that's one whole different path. So what I do know is that when I'm working on a personal project, so the the rugs I do are custom. They're made to order for the client. So what I need to do is, as I've said, hone in on what their own personal color is. And they're living with that color. So I think that the trends are, in fact, I try to steer my clients away from trends if they go down that path. Because as you and I know, it's cyclical. But these people are going to live with this rug forever. The rugs are going to last forever. So I want them to find something that's true to them. Mm -hmm. And so we try to find what that is. And I try to steer them away from something that might be trendy because, you know, by the time you're at a certain age, and most of my clients are of a certain age because they can afford to, to invest in a carpet like this, they have more of a sense of self. They're not necessarily looking to their peers or looking out outward for what the trends are. Of course, it's going to influence some decisions and how they live, but not on these big ticket items, because that's about their home and their private space. That is very different from you know, this world that you're now living, the people that you're working with, the product yeah. that you're working with, with how you started off, which was uh, then again in, in magazines. How how different is that when it comes to color and, and texture to what you're doing now? I mean, that is two worlds it's apart. Huge. huge, yeah. 
Well, you know, again, the fun part of life for me is the, is the change. I mean, I'm not somebody who likes routine. So I started out as a fine artist and then I was very lucky to get a, an internship with magazines. And my family had been involved with magazines. So magazines were a very natural environment for me. So I was very excited. So I started working in magazines, which is an extension of graphic design, but very limited, you know, four color press, churn them out every week, there's another magazine or whatever. So then I transitioned into doing fine art again and then surface design. So at each turn, you know, there's new materials, there's new medium, they're all things that are a new challenge. And I love learning. That's what my motivation is. That's what drives me. So whenever there's a new chance to learn, I get excited. So, you know, when I was doing uh, surface design on papers and learning how to use uh, reflective paints or uh, iridescent paints or foils, and uh, then I started doing printing and publishing for social expression, we got to use, you know, foil, which is really reflective. So what I started to see is a transition also. So when I went from that kind of two-dimensional graphic design, high production volume. And I went into rugs. One of the things that I was excited about was that I no longer had to produce something for 10,000 people. I just needed one person to like the design or I was doing a design for one person. To me, that was very satisfying for a whole nother list of reasons. But so what I noticed is that I could start to use silk and silk would mimic in graphic design, the use of foils. So that reflective quality. So then I started getting into knowing how to use the wool, which is matte and absorbs light versus the silk, which might reflect light and give off a little bit of a shimmer, you know, makes it a little more organic. So you'll start to see that there is a continuity, even though changing materials across the board. And industries completely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I've always been fascinating by the the dyeing and spinning process of yeah. fibers. I mean, I yeah. see that in in the images that you know through your your Instagram account to to how we connect. And I've learned that your rugs are mainly produced in in Asia, so Nepal. Is that correct? Could you talk a little bit about how this comes about? Of course, not currently because she can't travel. But how would a certain point, because I know there is a time in in the year or in uh, every other year that you you go there. And then you work with people locally to produce your rugs. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yes. And in fact, it's a, a, that's a little bit lovelier than the way it really is. I, when I decided to go into this industry, I did a bunch of research. And as I said, my rugs in the, my family is in the rug business. They did were more traditional, um, you know, Persian rugs and so forth. And yet when I went to do my research, I found that the rugs that I was drawn to were all from Nepal that had a different quality of wool. The patterning was different. The coloring was different. So I realized that that's where I needed to go. And I had a friend who was uh, actually an international climber who spent most of his time in Nepal. And I went to talk to him and he said, well, you just have to go to Nepal to find your weaver. So I did all the research I could on the front end. There is also a, um, a nonprofit group in the U.S. called Good Weave. They're actually all around the world, but they're based in the DC mm -hmm. and they make sure that there's no child labor involved. I went, I worked with them to get a list of names of weavers. I sent three different weavers designs as a test. And then I said, I'm coming over and we can meet. So I actually transitioned out of one job. And then like a week after that job ended, I was on an airplane for Nepal. And when I was in Nepal, I just went and interviewed a number of weavers, the three that were willing to do samples, I inspected their samples, I inspected their facilities, I saw how the weavers were treated, I saw how the process went, you know, there's a whole number of things. I interviewed a number of weavers, and it was so fascinating. That was sort of the process of exploring Nepal. And one of the things that was interesting to me is years into this relationship, so I ended up selecting one weaver, been very happy working with him. And I say him, he sort of owns it. And so there's a number of weavers. I think they have, I want to say up to a hundred looms, not that they're all active at one time, but um, turns out that I was an experiment for him as well, because I was his first digital client up <laughs> until then they'd only worked with flat art that was shipped over like by mail or FedEx. And I was the first person who was going to be able to send him digital files and then the translation would happen. So we were both testing each other out without knowing it, but it's been a very successful relationship. And I've how had- have you been with him? How long have you been with this weaver? It's been, uh, I think, since 2004. Yeah, we have a fairly seamless relationship at this point. I mean, seamless communication. I, I'm able to send them information uh, on the computer. They get, you know, we have a little back and forth and they send me the rugs. And while I would like to go there and spend more time 
doing experimentation, I really just can't afford to do that. Um, I've been twice and I sort of showed my face so I could see the weavers. And But my weaver also would come to the U.S. on a regular basis, so I would meet with him here. It does sound if, like a wonderful experience, though, to be able to go there, go to Nepal, which obviously is a country that not a lot of people get to go to, right. um, and mm-hmm. then work with, with the people that let's say, translate your design into something that's tangible? You know, I have to say that one of the most exciting points in my life was when I decided to, to do the rugs. And so I'll, I think you know what this feeling is like. I was ready for change. And then when this came about, again, there was just this percolating magic. And I was so filled with excitement. But there are lots of stages. I mean, it was a concept. I'll design rugs, but does that mean it's viable? Can I make it happen? So part of that was doing my research, figuring it out, getting designs together and then going to Nepal, meeting the weavers. It's just, and at every step, there's a chance for it to not work or to not feel right mm-hmm. or not to come together. But I got to Nepal. I met with the weavers. Everything just fell into place. It felt right. It felt comfortable. I thought I can do this. Then when I got my first samples, I was blown away. They were so much better than I dreamed they would be. And w- w- you're talking about having them, you know, I, I say they make my dreams come true, but well, yeah. they do. They, they do. The dreams yeah. come true. I mean, you have something that obviously, you know, is born in a vision. You yeah. put that in the, in, the, in the end, in the digital file, in the computer, after probably doing some sketching, but then in the end, they have to make it work. <laughs> Yeah. And so one of the times I, so my designs were, cons, are, were considered unusual. The rug industry has shifted since I started, but I remember speaking to my weaver and I said, well, you know, how, is this, do the weavers enjoy this? And they said, well, it's very hard. Some of them don't like it. It's too hard for them. And I said, well, that's great. I don't want them working on my rugs. So some of the weavers like the challenge of something intricate and complicated. And some of them just want to do that mechanical tying a knot, tying a knot, tying a knot without having any of the um, artistic influence. So, you know, I said to them, don't put them on my rugs then because that, that's going to impact the way it comes out. Yeah, it does. I, I truly yeah. believe in that and how energy flows and how, yeah. it, you know, somebody wanting to do uh, to be on a project, for example, how that influences the the outcome. So I think that is indeed a very sensible decision in a world where in the end, we are talking about feelings and we are talking about emotions, especially when right color but in design generally well and the rugs are so luscious i mean the wool and the silks they're just dreamy and so to just to touch them and to smell them and to see the the color and as i said i love to use silk just as a little bit of unexpected surprise in the rugs and they're irresistible i have to say <laughs> i had I the, uh, the chance to to touch and feel you know smaller pieces of your rugs uh, back in san diego i remember when mm, we were in mm-hmm. the color marketing group international summit and we both spoke so that was also an interesting event. We were both on the stage doing uh, presentations on our work, completely different. But it was, I remember a super fun experience. And I finally got to, um, you know, see also your carpets, touch and feel them, which indeed, I think there's nothing like just looking at them on screen. Obviously, you have to touch and feel something like that. And I'm, I'm pleased that I did. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things for people to understand is, you know, I, obviously, I have vision and I can see it and I have experience, but to convey going from a two-dimensional design on a piece of paper to what that final rug is that's just full of life. And, you know, the handmade quality, as we said, that just infuses into the piece. That's the beauty of it also. And the fact that the the wools, you know, that's a whole nother conversation, but the wools dye differently depending on the kinds. So there's just this variegation of color in the wool that's a, a beautiful thing in that form by itself, much less when it goes into a hand knotted thing. And so every step of the way, I do feel like it's a collaborative effort. I've designed it, but there's so many steps along the way until it gets to the client's floor. And, and, and again, then it's just a big surprise. Where do you find color inspiration for your rug designs? Or, and also at this point, you know, different texture and patterns. Where do you go or how do you uh, come about your inspirations on a daily or weekly basis? Or I think the, the issue for me is it's it's like a fountain that doesn't shut off. And so for me, I don't have to look for it. I almost have to train my eye to start to be more discerning because I mean, every single thing around me, I start to see pattern and I, I see light and I see, I'm sure you do this. Like if I'm out driving, like, Oh, there's five blue cars in a row. And then there's one white one. And then there's five more blue. So I just see it everywhere. My, my main things that get my juices flowing um, are travel and nature. So 
I have no problem. I don't have to look for inspiration. I, I really, I have to learn how to, to channel it actually. So for um, you, it's innate. Let's, let's call it that's innate. It's something that just automatically happens. And yeah. it is something that you even get overwhelmed by. It sounds like sometimes. Yes, that's exactly. Well, I, I think of a specific thing, which is that um, scuba diving and I was uh, diving in Indonesia and I literally thought my head was going to explode because I, I can hardly talk about it. The colors of the underwater life and the texture, I mean, everything I love, warm water, color, vibrant colors that you don't expect to find in nature and the textures of the corals and the fish. I mean, I thought I was going to explode. And I thought the next time I do this, I'll have to photograph it because I have to document it. Um, you know, a good secure way to keep your memories but um no it's fortunately it's not but i do get that i mean we are all guilty i mean when we go to our conferences and when we get to see each other you see all of us you know especially at sunsets some of your own back in tucson <laughs> you know we're all standing there with her our phone and sometimes you're not even enjoying the moment but you're trying to capture it on your phone so that you can remember it while we don't understand that our brains you know they can capture it much better than <laughs> yeah. a, a photo camera can. But it's a, it's a yeah. fun, funny context in which we, we tend to uh, live nowadays. Do you have well, a, a project that you're currently working on that you're passionate about or something that, you know, after this, this lockdown, you will uh, work on? Well, to be honest, this lockdown has shifted my energy so dramatically. At the beginning, I was so excited to be in my studio and I felt like I had been given free time just to be, you know, reckless abandon with color in the studio and dyeing fabrics and painting and mixing colors and uh, trying new patterns, which is a good way for me to design my rugs, you know, just like let it rip. And then somewhere down the line, I can adapt things to a design. And then my energy shifted to the outdoors. And then I became obsessed with my garden, those big, huge red ripe tomatoes and beets that were huge in the colors of the garden. And you know what? It hasn't left the garden yet. So while I do have a couple of rugs in, in the works, my energy is outdoors right now. And I don't know what's going to happen if our, when COVID starts to shift and we have more freedom and go back to maybe what we had before. Yeah. Probably, probably not what you were expecting to hear, but no, no, I think this is good because I don't think people are waiting for a pep talk on how uh, great our creativity, creative creative <laughs> have been flowing during COVID. I think we've all had moments and we just we want to just, you know, rip our uh, hair out of our head and just uh, or go just do a big, deep winter sleep like like bears do and wake up when this is all over. I mean, it has been an interesting period. There has been some creative projects coming alive, but I know that for many people and many creatives, this has not been an easy time because we right. are visual. We need yeah. to connect. We need to travel. We need some of that color inspiration. That's hard during COVID. Yeah, it is hard. And Well, I've, I've really, uh, as I've said, nature is a big deal for me. So what I've liked is that during this very difficult time, and like you or what you're saying is hibernation feels like the natural place to be right now. But being able to get outside and put my hands in the dirt and touch the plants and go ride in the green fields, as I said, California is very green in the winter. That sort of is trying to, it's sort of trying to recharge my battery every day. Grounding literally um, into our, our beings and how we probably came to this, came to this life. And I think we've also forgotten that a little bit. Yeah. I, 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 what I have to do also is keep faith and trust that a creative uh, force has been driving my entire life. And I, what I'm trying to do it as a more mature woman is to realize that force is not gone it's not even dormant. It's just pausing until the next surge comes along. And so that's, that's where I'm trying to keep my uh, faith. I think that is exactly uh, what, what people would need to hear that even though maybe at this moment, they're not plugging into their best selves or their most creative selves, that it's still within you. Uh, but indeed, as you said, it's dormant and it's just uh, waiting to come alive again. Thank you. Alicia. I, I, I really look forward to that. Yeah, thank you. I, this is fun. I look, uh, I look forward to that too. And I know that here in Italy, we're waiting for spring. So the nicer, um, more longer, beautiful days are coming mm -hmm. along. And then hopefully, you know, we will be again outdoors more and, and getting more of that inspiration. Yeah. And that we can actually see each other.
Yeah, that would be great too. <laughs> I want to okay. thank you for your talk and your information. I feel inspired, uh, which I always feel when I when I talk to you. And I love our our connection. I loved your examples, and I know the audience will do too. And I I truly thank you from the bottom of my heart. No, thank you. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for being on the Color Authority. Stay tuned for my next conversation with Bridget Frizzy from Kehoe Designs. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.